Welcome to Side Fisher House. Welcome to Side Fisher House. This is our room. room. We're watching TV all the time. Hang out on Sunday now. Yeah, 
This is our kitchen. But we do our cooking. This is Veggie Devil Tail and this is Bowser. and to not to be independent so I can have a home on myself. To, uh, make friends and meet new people and be more in depth with uh, Jesus Christ. You don't have to cook for yourself. Yeah. Make your own food. Do your own wine. Eat cream. The best part about living at Friendship House for me is um, just growing alongside awesome individuals that uh, other people just wouldn't expect uh, to grow alongside of. Uh, they teach me as much as we teach them. So um, it's just been really exciting to see uh, our relationships bloom. I like, my best part is living with roommates and I like to hang out with them and like playing games with them and watching movies together when we have movie nights. Getting to live with all these wonderful and amazing people. Friendship House is a housing model where college students and young adults with disabilities live together in community as roommates. We operate under the idea that community happens best when people eat, pray, and celebrate together. As the seventh friendship house in the nation, alongside places like Duke University and Vanderbilt University, we believe this unique model puts a spotlight on the creative ways that small towns can address unemployment and the lack of community that our friends with disabilities face.
Good morning, Mount Pleasant. It's good to be virtually together again. Hopefully the day is getting closer when we can gather together uh, in the church sanctuary and, and worship together. I look forward to that. But I uh, want to continue to uh, share with you things that are going on uh, online right now. 
Uh, this Thursday evening will be another uh, in our series of uh, Bible studies on Zoom, uh, dealing with uh, coronavirus stress or really, you know, whatever kind of stress. My wife, Kathy, is leading that. That'll be Thursday evening at 630. If you didn't get a chance to take part last week, uh, that Zoom meeting is recorded and it's on Facebook and you can you can uh, watch it there. But if you want to be live, uh, the Zoom address, the information for that is on, on Facebook. Or if you're not on Facebook and you want me to send it to you, uh, let me know. Uh, my email address is there at the bottom of the screen, and we'll be glad to send that information to you. It is good to download Zoom and, and get signed in with a, an account before uh, Thursday evening. That takes a little bit of time, but love for you to be a part of that. Our youth group and our children's ministries are also continuing to meet, sometimes on Zoom, sometimes on Facebook. But check out the uh, children's Facebook page as well as the youth group Facebook page to find out the times and all of that for when they're meeting and uh, continuing to be connected that way. I know some of your life groups and other groups are doing that. Celebrate Recovery is doing that as well. So I am, uh, I've said to several people, I'm so thankful that we have the technology in this day to be able to stay connected in this way when we have to stay home. So um, thanks for all those who are leading those. Uh, I want to continue to remind you that uh, in this time of when we're not in the building, that doesn't mean there aren't expenses. There do continue to be expenses in the life of the church, and uh, our finance team is doing a fantastic job of keeping up with that, but they can't do it without you. And so as we get continue to worship this morning, I want you to continue to be prayerful about the way in which you support the church financially. Uh, you can do that through the online giving if you haven't set that up already bit.ly slash mtpgive. The address is at the bottom of the screen. A lot of you are also mailing checks to the church. That works too. They come through the mail and we're, we get those deposited. And then uh, you can also use your bank's bill pay if you don't want to go through the online. Bill pay is free uh, to both ends. So you can go into your, bank's, uh, your bank account, have them send a check to the church, and those that works as well. So However you choose to do that, we are very thankful. I am very thankful and for the ways in which you've continued to support the church. So as we do that during our normal time of offering here, let's continue to worship. As Overwhelming presence Rest upon us, overtaking every hindrance to trust, overflowing spirit, rise from my dust, over all, over all, and overwhelming presence. Rest upon us, overtaking every. To trust overflowing spirit rise from my dust over all over all so rise the king is in the room and rise the king is in the room and rise
Hi, Mount Pleasant family. We welcome you into our home and so glad to be able to be together today. I'm reading out of the book of John, chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father has told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask using my name. This is my commandment. Love each other. I clearly and distinctly remember several sermons that use metaphors. Let me give you some examples. Tom Barnett on a Sunday night had Stephen Hines fix his delicious succulent rib, prime rib, I'll have you to know, steak and cut up in little bitty pieces, just not to whet your appetite. And the point that Tom was making through that metaphor of that prime rib was that I can tell you how good it is, but until you taste it, you really won't get it. And it was the truth about taste and see that the Lord is good. The second one I remember with Laura Smith gave a message and she used an onion and she peeled layers and he talked about the idea, use that as a metaphor, to talk about the idea that the Lord, uh, in a process, peels layers that we need to get rid of, and we call it sanctification. Also, uh, a pastor friend of mine uses meta uh, the metaphors of uh, Star Wars characters and objects and to, to make points. And I even got some of them and even remembered some of them. But the Bible is chock full of metaphors. What, what for? To help us understand what God is like and how it relates to us. Jesus used metaphors all the time to help us picture, have mind pictures, and connect with what he was communicating, what he really wanted us to get a hold of, teach, to apply in our lives. Just let me give you a, a few examples, but he talked about the sparrows. And he talked about if two sparrows fall to the ground and they're not worth much, and he observes that, how much more he cares for and loves us and sees the things that goes on in our lives. Some other metaphors he used, every com common everyday things that people could identify with, uh, such as flowers and birds and seed and coins, a wash basin and a towel that we just observed uh, during Holy Week as a symbol, as a metaphor for being a servant. Uh, fishing, sheep, wind, fire, a door. So I stand at the door and knock and he is the door into the way of eternal life and a relationship with him. And in our scripture today, Jesus used the metaphor of vine and branches to help us picture the oneness in our relationship with him and our friendship with him. I cannot emphasize enough that how we picture God, how we think about God, and how he sees us is so important in having a healthy life, a healthy spiritual life, a mental attitude, and it affects us physically. Even putting our faith, having faith, in God and that relationship it makes all the difference in the world. I got a call from Mary uh, at the, with the hospice program and she had followed up on after my daughter's death, December the 10th. You know it's strange how certain dates will always set in your mind. Uh, December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. But even more now for me will be December the 10th. But she was calling with follow up and I really appreciated it. And I talked to her I told her that at times it, 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 I grieved 
uh, and it hit me at strange times, in different ways, but I just went with it. Uh, but what I said, I do sorrow, but I don't sorrow without hope. And she responded, what a difference that makes as she makes phone calls and follows up. Those with no faith are hopeless, and their life begins that way and, and runs that way. But those with faith, the hope that they have and how they're able to deal with that in a much better way. You know, there's plenty of psychological and medical research to show uh, why our images, how we think about God matters so much. Scholars have found correlations between the ways a person imagines God and think about him and the people who pri primarily imagine God or think about God as distant and judging, critical and harsh, as opposed to those that think, uh, realize they have that intimacy with God and that loving relationship. Uh, those people that don't think in those terms are not as physically and mentally healthy. For me, it was a huge trans transformation. Going from the God that was so hard to please, harsh, uh, ready to, to, to punish, from a God of, of intimacy and loving relationship, it absolutely transformed me from depression to having victory and enjoying life, that abundant life in John 10 that Christ promised. The images of God in the Bible is like a multifaceted diamond. You turn it and turn it, but there is always more to see. You cannot figure out God, all aspects of him. If you did, he wouldn't be God. But if you just pick one image and you stay with that, it puts God in a box and tries to limit him, and that doesn't work. That's why in the Old Testament, the Jewish people had various names for Jehovah to show his different qualities and aspects, characteristics of God, such as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals physical and emotional needs, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Adonai, the sovereign Lord, and in the New Testament, Jesus. And these are two that I these pictures and images I keep in mind constantly because whatever happens in my life, I filter it through as, as God the good father, me as his child. And I picture the father of the prodigal son or the good shepherd that cares for his own, protects them and provides for them. Each image meets a different need in our lives at the time that we need them different way we might be with and for God. Like the song that says about God, you have problems, he's the problem taker. You have addictions, he's the chain breaker. Lost, he's a way maker. And you need a miracle, God is a miracle worker. At times we need to see God as Isaiah did in chapter 6, the sovereign God the holy God. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the earth was filled with his glory. Then Isaiah realized, I'm a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. Then the seraphim took a hot coal and touched his lips and said, you are forgiven, you are cleansed. That's the opportunity that we have this day. The God of the universe, the sovereign, forgives us and made provision for that and then he also cleanses us, changes us within. There are two main parts of this sermon. If you just get these two, I'll be pleased. I've been praying about uh, that it's revealed to you and you personally uh, understand that and you apply them in your life. The first is Psalm 145.3. God's greatness is unsearchable. Let me repeat that. God's Grace and greatness is unsearchable. It's kind of like uh, talks about in Corinthians. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift, Paul talks about. It's something that we can't totally comprehend. But the second thing I want us to realize, the God of the unsearchable greatness desires, let me repeat that, desires and invites us into an intimate relationship and friendship with him. 
I know it's hard to wrap our minds to conceive that God is our friend. The one who's the, the creator, sustainer, sovereign of the universe, wants to be personal, individual, and he runs after our friendship. You know, like the many things of God, it can't be explained, but it sure can be experienced. And I have experienced it, and what a difference that it makes that he walks with me and talks with me each day. That God is, I live and move and have my being in him. The metaphor of friendship with God comes from the writers of the Old Testament who speak of Moses and Abraham as the friends of God. And it comes from the Gospel of John where Jesus tells his disciples that they are no longer his servants but his friends as we read in Scripture as Sherry did. Then he proclaimed at the same time the ultimate of that friendship. John 15, 13, he states, No greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what he did. Theodore of Cyrus, a 5th century bishop, said that friendship with God is the entire goal of the Christian life. Friendship with God is the entire goal of the Christian life. And in my experience in these many years now, and how quickly they go, is God simplified it in his command to love him each and every day to walk in that friendship and that will cause you to love others. I want you to think a moment about maybe you have a best friend or what makes for a good friend. I think one of the, the main things is that you can tell them anything. You can trust them. They won't be critical, make fun of you, and judgmental. They're loyal. Also, a friend is comfortable to be around. A companion. Uh, I know many, because of the coronavirus, is experiencing a lot of loneliness, especially if you don't have a companion. Uh, Sherry and I, I have that companionship with her. But those that are alone, I really, my heart goes out to them. But I want to recommend, because I know my loneliest day as a Christian, and I've had a few, is not even close to the emptiness and the loneliness I felt when I didn't have Christ as Savior and companion. Jesus, by his Spirit, is the comforter, a companion in communion, fellowship with God. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, in, friends enjoy spending time together, doing life together, being real and genuine, but also be encouraging and positive and laughing together, not negative people that complain, but just having a good time together. I have three friends I went to high school with and, and played football with, and we golfed together quite a bit, so we couldn't during the coronavirus, uh, so we played virtual golf. Oh, man, we were legends in virtual golf. We had holes in one. We drove the ball 300 yards. Then finally we had to get, get a grasp on reality and get back to our game. And it, and it took much, much longer. Uh, but I really appreciate these guys, and we do do life together. They have a sense of humor. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, one of them texts. Uh, we had a lot of laughs. Sherry would have listened part of it, and she laughed too, but... One of the guys texted, I meant to tell you guys about my wonderful wife. She loves me so much. I woke up this morning. She was over, over, over me holding a pillow tight over my face. She said she was protecting me from the virus. Isn't she the best? And, of course, we had to respond sarcastically, uh, you're a lucky man, a lucky man. Uh, but, but he did text back, but it was kind of hard to breathe. But then he got real transparent, and he expressed his heartfelt emotion. He said, four guys in their 70s that have been friends and teammates and buddies for over 55 years. Then he put priceless and blessed. He said, love you guys. You know, the key ingredient is what Jesus commanded in John 15, 12. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Think about Jesus, his, his patience, his investment in them, how much he cared, how much he carried their load. We're to love in that same way. 
the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's an old book, but it's a goodie by Dale Carnegie. It teaches a lot of biblical principles. And one very important one is to be other-focused. If you want to have friends, be other-focused. The same that began the book of The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's also the one another in the New Testament, the one another's. I don't know if you remember, but we made a card and uh, we got 26 one another's just of the New Testament. Get a copy of that and put that in a place where it reminds you. I, I make a schedule out every Monday or, or did before this, the coronavirus, and I put it where I made that schedule and I look at it every week to, make, to remind me. This is what God called me to be, and by His Spirit I can be this and make a difference in other people's lives. Just an example, honor one another above yourself. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Carry each other's burdens. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Make your love increase and overflow for each other. To have a friend, be a friend. I'd like for you to watch this clip. It's humorous, but it says a lot. Also, a true friend steps in when everyone else steps out. The Lord has led me in that way in a lot of situations to do with jail visits, the courts, through Celebrate Recovery Program. You know, also, not only friends step in when others step out, but maybe you've stepped out on yourself, that you've given up on yourself. Remember how Peter must have felt. And I especially think about after the betrayal and denial of the Lord, he got eye to eye with the Lord, and that melted him. That's, that broke him, and it said he went out and wept. And he thought it was all over, and he went back fishing. But remember when the ladies were at the tomb, and they, and they told the disciples that Jesus was going to meet them in Galilee, he said specifically, and Peter, including Peter is what he was saying. The story of Bud Welch and daughter Julia. Bud was expecting his daughter to call from her work at the Muir Federal Building in Oklahoma City. He never did get that call. There was an explosion from a bomb set by Timothy McVeigh that killed his daughter. Bill, or Bud said, you would not believe the anger and bitterness that I lived with so long. I wanted revenge. Several months later, and this was destroying his spirit and his life and his relationship with others, that bitterness and that anger, he saw Timothy McVeigh's dad, Bill McVeigh, and Jennifer on TV. This was the dad of Timothy McVeigh and the sister. She was a school teacher and the, he did an interview but tears were coming out of Bill McVeigh's eyes as he apologized so much sincerely uh, for his son's actions. And his daughter as a school teacher had many of the students, the parents that she taught 
not want her as a teacher because of what Tim had done. Bud Welch, uh, Julie's dad, the one that was, was killed, said God spoke to him at that moment and said, I lost a daughter, but he all lost a son and much more. And he went to a lot of effort to make contact with Bill McVeigh. And he uh, forgave him uh, and he befriended him. And they became lifelong friends in time together. And he made the statement to them, first of all, and he said, we're in this together. I told Jennifer and her dad, for the rest of our lives, we, can cha we can't change the past, but we have a choice about the future. And he said, I was thinking that I'd gone to church all my life and never felt as close to God as I did at that moment when he befriended Bill McVeigh and Jennifer. You know, they say if you have five good friends, you're well off. Well, I want to tell you and declare to you by my experience, if you have Jesus as your friend, you're rich in Christ. Proverbs 18.24 states, A man that has friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I have three good brothers that I love, and they would do anything if I gave them a call. But they can't always be there. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to close with this story. In the hills of Scotland, there's piles of rocks dotted the landscape. They're called Cairns. Now, if I had a Scottish, Scottish accent, Cairns, uh, but that's not too good. Uh, but back in the ancient days, uh, when a friend would come by the house, they would put a rock on the pile to show that they were a friend. If they were an enemy and they came by, they took off a rock. And it kind of remind me of the idea about friendship. You know, we need to befriend those that Jesus calls us to befriend. The outcast, the poor, also his saints, the family of God, to show those kinds of friendships, hospitality and generosity. But we can, by our lives on an everyday basis, we can add a stone of friendship by building up or we can take away one of those rocks by tearing down and I got to thinking you know I talk a, a lot about the idea of and I'm so thankful to the Lord I would I, I fear to think where I'd be today without relationship with the Lord as far as reward and regret I don't want to end my life with regret but a reward I make that statement to the inmates in the jail when we go to do ministry quite a bit because they're starting to evaluate their lives. Do they want only one life, only one chance? They want to live a life of regret or reward and how they could start that day with Christ, with that transformation and living out their lives to live a life of reward. So at the end, we need to ask ourselves, will our Karens, our pile of rocks be shorter or taller. I'd like to close in prayer. You know, I never like to close out a service without an invitation because it's God's invitation to come unto Him. If you ought to stand at the door and knock, if any man will open, I will come unto Him, and He unto me, and we'll have fellowship with one another. Uh, it says, All you that are heavy, burdened and heavy laden, come to Him. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. So he invites us, the God of more than we can even comprehend, the sovereign God, God Almighty, invites us into a friendship with him that we can walk with him each day. He can be a part of our lives and guide and direct us and love us and love through us. Good prayer by his spirit is God, think through me, live through me, love through me. I want to close with this prayer. Jesus, show us how to love with your love, not just our own, 
Our love is so limited. Lord, help me to make an impact, impression on others all of my days, that day at a time, as your spirit of love flows through me in joy and peace. May I be your friends to the friendless, those that you direct me to by your spirit and prompt me to be their friends and to walk into situations where others walk out and to be the kind of friend that you tell us about. We just thank for your goodness, dear Lord, your grace, your heart. And we live that out in Christ's name. Amen.
I want to close with this benediction out of Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord goes before you and is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So do not fear. Do not be discouraged. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.